So um, what we're asking is, is the climate response to the sum of many forcings the same or statistically indistinguishable to the sum of the responses to all of the individual forcings? Or are there interactions between the forcings that render the response not linear? Um, and there have been a couple studies that say, you know, basically, if you're looking at really big scales, global scales, even continental or regional scales, and you're looking in the historical period, eh, everything looks basically kind of linear. Um, and if you look at smaller scales, regional scales, then you start getting nonlinearities, especially far into the future, and so the RCPs, you get nonlinearities. But, you know, consensus seems to be, eh, everything looks pretty linear in the historical period at really big scales. Um, and this is, this is kind of an important question, I would say, because um, it's, it's really important to the textual attribution community where I come from, um, because um, it helps us in attribution studies. Um, it's important for pattern scaling studies, and also for things like the CMF6 experimental design. Like, how many experiments do we have to do if we can if, um, get the response to some like individual forcing or set of forcings by linear combinations of other simulations we've already done? So, you know, can we use linearity to really cut down on the number of simulations that we have to do? And I would argue it's also kind of interesting in and of itself because it lets us understand the interactions between forcing. Um, so I used uh, this was made for another audience. I don't need to tell you about the GIST model, but I used uh, basically two versions of the R model. The H, uh, I also checked gets H, looks pretty similar, so we're just going to focus on the R here. Um, so using the NID and DCAT versions. And so in this talk, I'll talk about um, a couple hypotheses that I'm going to test simultaneously. So a signal to noise hypothesis um, and additivity hypothesis. And I'm also going to talk about them at multiple time scales. Um, I'm going to talk about, try to attribute the nonlinearities, spoiler alert, that we find to differences in the models. So then I'm going to talk about the physical mechanisms. Um, okay, so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the hypotheses that I'm looking at here. Um, so I'm going to test two hypotheses simultaneously because they're easy and why not? Um, so the two hypotheses are what I'm going to call H noise. So are the trends that we see significantly different from internal variability? Do they matter? Um, and to do that, I'm going to use signal to noise ratios as uh, defined in a bajillion uh, detection attribution studies. Um, simultaneously, I'm going to uh, I'm going to test the hypothesis, which I'll call H, add, or H additive. So are the historical trends equal to the sum of the trends in the single forcing experiments? And to do this, I'm going to use a modified statistical contrast test. So just kind of walking through how the really easy way that we use to test H noise here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take every single control run in the SIGMA 5 archive, so not just the GIST model, but all the models, and catenate them together. And this gives me an understanding or kind of an estimate I would argue a pretty conservative estimate of the amplitude of internal variability. Um, I'm going to calculate L length trends, you can see them uh, red here, in non overlapping segments of this uh, concatenated control run, and build up a distribution. And this is a distribution of 100 year trends in the concatenated control runs. Um, and the standard deviation of this um, is going to be a measure of the noise due to internal variability. So the signal to noise ratio is defined as the L length trend in, in this study, either global average temperature or global average precipitation. So we're looking at real simple, real global quantities here. Um, we're going to normalize those by that noise measure. So basically, what's the typical um, L length trend that you would expect to get from internal variability alone? If that value exceeds 2.7, it's significant with respect to climate noise at 99%. If, 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 sorry, um, if it exceeds 2, that's basically significant with respect to climate noise at 95%. And if you don't like this, if you think this is really stupid and you don't want to pay attention, all we're doing is taking these trends, normalizing the temperature and precipitation trends by a constant. Um, and the results of the second hypothesis that we're going to test, and I would argue the more interesting one, are valid even if we got the noise completely wrong. So if you don't like this, forget I ever told you about it. But we can do it, we can get it for free, why not? Um, so as a simple sanity check, let's look at century scale temperature and precipitation trends in these single forcing experiments and make sure that these signal to noise ratios are telling us what we expect. Why do you use three signal? Uh, that's a good question, because why not? Um, I think, why I not like one, why, not one, why not one signal? Why not, one why not five signals? Um, and I think that's a great question, and I think the answer is that I'm not going to claim anything based on the statistics alone. What I just want is a flag to tell me, hey, this is something that might be interesting to look at. So I don't believe that you should really trust anything that's just a statistic, like that's just reported within statistical confidence of whatever, one sigma, two sigma, five sigma, if you don't have a physical understanding. 
So basically, I'm just going to use these tests to like flag up things that might be interesting to look at. But I think that's a good question. That's a good valid one. And by the way, this methodology revealed some bugs in our simulations. Mm -hmm. I don't. <laughs> Shocked. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those. The simulations are perfect. No. After we know what they are in to them, they are perfect. Right. Yes. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, let's look first at the Nint single forcing ensembles. Um, and so this graph is going to take a little bit of explaining. So outside this vertical oriented box here, if something's outside this box, that means that the temperature trend differs significantly from noise at 99% confidence. If it's outside this horizontally oriented box here, that means that the precipitation trend differs significantly from Something's up here in this quadrant, it means that it's got a significant temperature trend and a significant precipitation trend at arbitrary confidence level. Um, so let's start and make sure that, you know, just kind of basic sanity check. So, what about anthropogenic aerosols? So, right here, anthropogenic aerosols show us significant negative century scale temperature and precipitation trends. And, you know, duh, like this is what they're supposed to do. Um, this, is, this is perfectly. Um, greenhouse gases, the other way around. Greenhouse gases show a significant positive temperature and precipitation trends. Land use changes don't really do anything, so not only are they not significant with respect to, I'm not saying they don't do anything, like, I've got some like, shocked looks, I'm not saying they don't do anything, period, but they don't do anything with this very, very crude global measurement. So they've got insignificant trends with respect to noise, and also they're compatible with zero. That's why you, you're using the entire scene of archive for all models, or is it just for this guess? Just for, for, just, just for guess. Just so for guess to characterize the noise. Okay. There's five ensemble okay. numbers for each simulation. Okay. And so this box here is a measure of the ensemble uncertainty. Okay, um, but it's but only for guess models. It's only for guess models. Right. I, um, the reason that I'm only using guess models is A, I work here, and B, um, only two modeling groups submitted the full suite of experiments that you need to look at um, in order to do these hypothesis tests to the single five archive. So I have similar um, results for CCSM4. Um, the CCSM4 results are almost identical to the NIT results, I guess, um, which is good, encouraging. Can you please um, mention that in all your publications? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's really important, I think. <laughs> um, here's ozone. So ozone gives us positive temperature and precipitation trends, but over the century scale, it doesn't do anything significant with respect to climate noise. Um, here's natural forcing here. Um, note I had to combine solar and volcanic because there was an error um, in the volcanic simulations. So if you're trying to use the single forcing, you guess volcanic only simulations don't. Um, there's an error with those. Uh, but I think these are right. And you know, like as expected, natural forcing doesn't really do anything at the century scale. They're not significant with respect to noise, and the trends are compatible with zero. Um, so here's the historical ensemble. Um, so these are the GIS R mint historical ones. So they're run forced with all of these different forcings. So it contains all of the above. We see there's a positive temperature trend, which is significantly above the noise here. But there's a negative precipitation trend, and that negative trend is compatible with noise. So basically, if you look at these historical simulations over the century scale, you see warming, great, you know, that, that makes sense. But you don't see a significant change in precipitation. Um, so what about TCAT? What about these uh, uh, single forcing experiments with the interactive chemistry? Um, and because TCAT is forced with emissions as opposed to concentrations, the set of single forcing experiments is different than in the NIT case. So what do these other single forcing experiments look like here? Again, anthropogenic aerosols look pretty similar, even though they're forced with emissions as opposed to concentrations. So you've got a precipitation trend which is negative and significantly so. And you've got a temperature trend, which is also negative, but in this case, it's less significant. Land use changes, um, because I, they weren't performed with TCADI, um, I just used the NINT land use instead. Um, if you want to yell at me about that, that's fine. Um, but it doesn't matter very much at these global scales. Um, natural forcing is really similar to the NINT trends. Um, the historical forcing is here. So this is TCADI run with all the set of historical experiments. And we see that there's a positive significant temperature trend and a precipitation trend, which is compatible with zero and less negative than in the NIT case, but not significantly so. This is um, a simulation run with anthropogenic tropospheric reactive gases, so basically methane and other goodies. And methane gives us a positive significant temperature trend and a positive precipitation trend. Was that also with emissions, methane? Emissions or concentration? Uh, this is uh, concentration. This is historical. 
now, right? Yes. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and these are um, long-lived greenhouse gases. So um, this simulation bundles together greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, um, H2O, and um, importantly, CFCs. So CFCs are treated as a long-lived greenhouse gas here, and they're bundled in here. So there's no separate ozone-only run for the TCAP case, um, and no methane here. Um, and as we'd expect, we see significant positive temperature and precipitation trends. Um, so um, now we ask the question, we're going to test this hypothesis H additive. So is the historical signal-to-noise ratio equal to the sum of the single forcing signal-to-noise ratios? So we can get an estimator for this from the, um, the ensembles with uh, standard air that we get from the pool of standard deviation. It looks ugly, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, and the resulting statistic follows a student T distribution, which we can use to project this H additive hypothesis when this statistic differs significantly from zero, again at 99%, completely arbitrarily chosen confidence. Um, so the purple here is the sum. And we see that for the NIMP case, the sum and the historical are very similar for both temperature and precipitation trends. They're 99 confidence, 99 percent confidence intervals here overlap a lot. And so we can't reject HI in this case. We can't reject the hypothesis that the um, sum of the forcings, the response to the sum of the forcings is equal to the sum of the responses of the forcings. So in the non-interactive model, the model of non-interactive chemistry, temperature and precipitation trends appear additive. In TCADI, um, here, um, we don't reject H, uh, again, we don't reject the H additive at 99% confidence on the century scale. But interestingly, the sum of the temperature and precipitation trends is bigger than the historical temperature and precipitation trends, um, which in contrast with it. So before I move on, is there anything interesting about this graph? Can I beat this graph to that even more? Um, so to do that, I want to introduce um, a useful kind of simplistic concept, which I'll call excess precipitation. Um, so a lot of papers have started to decompose the precipitation uh, change, delta P, into this slow temperature mediated change, which is assumed to be independent of time and independent of forcing. And this slope H here is diagnosed by regressing changes in global average temperature versus changes in global average precipitation from the control runs. So clausius clapeyron and also energetic constraints, when we tend to get um, higher temperature, we tend to get more precipitation in the control runs. And so that's where we diagnose this slope H from. This uh, residual term here is the fast forcing dependent response. Um, so this excess precipitation is telling us is the precipitation that we observe more or less than we might expect from temperature change alone? Um, so in NIT, the excess precipitation, um, ozone, land use, and the natural, uh, natural forcing precipitation trends increase or decrease is basically expected from the temperature change alone. The precipitation trends and the temperature trends lie on this line right here. Um, the greenhouse gas excess precipitation trend is negative, which is unsurprising, and I'll explain why. The anthropogenic aerosol excess precipitation is negative, which is somewhat surprising, and this is um, probably has to do with the um, relationship between absorbing and scattering aerosols and gas, but I, I kind of want to talk about that a little bit more with people who actually know more about aerosols than I do. Um, and both the sum and the historical experiments have negative excess precipitation. Um, so by contrast, in TCADI, the long-lived greenhouse gases do not show negative excess precipitation. So here, this uh, uh, green box right here, looks like it's basically on this line right here. It's not offset below like it was in it, and that's going to turn out to be significant. Um, so I've been looking at century scales so far, and that's all well and good, but that's not the only scale that we care about, right? Like we care about many, many different time periods, and we care about um, trends that begin not just in 1900, but at different times throughout the historical record. So what I decided to do is just um, apply this H additive, this hypothesis test, to um, five-year trends, 10-year trends, 20-year trends, 30-year trends, 50-year trends, and 100-year trends, all throughout the historical record. So what I'm going to show here is if that hypothesis is rejected at 99% confidence, I'll indicate the years for which it's rejected. And then the color indicates the difference between the mean historical signal-to-noise 
and the mean sum of the single forcing signal to noise. So this is for temperature trends in NIT. So you can see right here for about night the 30-year trend from about 1960 to 1990, we reject that hypothesis, and the um, historical trend is slightly bigger than the sum of those single forcing trends. This is uh, the same for precipitation trends. So this hypothesis is almost never rejected except for sort of scattered five-year and 10-year trends. For TCADI, same thing. It's basically, we almost never reject this hypothesis for shorter trends throughout the record. But for TCADI precipitation trends, you see that 50-year trends, 30-year trends, 20-year trends, 10-year trends, clustered toward the end of the record, we really consistently reject that hypothesis. So for shorter trends later on in the record, the historical precipitation response is significantly less than the sum of the single forcing precipitation responses. Does that kind of make sense? It took me a while to try to develop this graph into a, a way that people could like intuitively look at it. Um, so I'd, I'd like some feedback on that if anybody has any. Um, so we know that different forcings are dominant at different time periods, right? So the global climate system responds to some forcings, like natural forcings, like the volcano goes off, aerosols, if you have changes in your composition of your aerosol emissions, can even switch sign in different time periods. <coughs> and so to look at which, which forcings are really dominant at which times, as an example, I want to focus on 30-year trends, which are relevant for me as a detection attribution person, because that's the approximate length of the satellite record and also the approximate length of, of me. So I think 30-year trends is, is great, and I'm going to focus on them for right now. Um, so anthropogenic aerosols, what, are they, what, what do anthropogenic aerosols look like? So these are 30-year temperature signal-to-noise ratios. And you can see they're basically almost always negative in the Kihati case. Um, but this here, this line, if you can see it, um, is the 99% confidence level. So they're negative, but they're not significantly negative with respect to 30-year trends due to internal variability alone. What about these anthropogenic tropospheric reactive gases, so basically methane? So methane basically always gives you, throughout the historical record, a positive 30-year temperature trend. But again, it's not significant at 99% confidence with respect to internal variability. Long-lived greenhouse gases here, so this is CO2 and CFCs plus some other stuff, always give you a positive 30-year temperature trend. And when you combine that with the methane-induced trend, the, the tropospheric reactive gases, get a combined trend that's significant at this, at this particular confidence level. Um, land use changes, very small trends, almost always negative, which is interesting. Um, natural forcings here. And then this is the sum. This is what happens when you sum up all of these trends. By contrast, you can compare it with the historical. So the purple is the sum, um, or the sum of the means, and this is um, uh, the black is the historical. You can see they look fairly similar. Um, contrast that with precipitation. So for 30-year um, trends in precipitation, you can see especially here towards the end of the record, um, the sum is consistently higher. You get a consistently uh, bigger increase in precipitation in the sum than you do in the historical. Um, and this is that excess precipitation. This is how much more or less precipitation you would get than what you would expect from the temperature change alone. And the thing that I want to flag here is that, try not to, to trip myself, um, so not only do you see a huge difference between the sum of the single forcing excess precipitations and the historical, but that coincides with what's going on here. So long-lived greenhouse gases give you negative um, excess precipitation up until about this time when suddenly they switch sign and they start giving you positive excess precipitation. Um, so by contrast, if you look at the top here, this is for the NIT case. So this is NIT temperature, NIT precipitation, and NIT excess precipitation. And what you can see is that they track each other very, very, very well in the NIT case. So you can't reject the hypothesis that these things are additive in the NIT case. 
Whereas here, in the Tihadi case, you know, here for precipitation later in the record, and especially for this excess precipitation, you really can't reject that hypothesis. Um, so what I want to do is I want to focus on why. Like, what's happening here later in the record? Yeah. So you're, you're comparing the single forcing versus the measurement, right? No, this is single forcing versus the um, historical ones. So there's no observations here. Okay. Uh, okay, so how are we going to attribute these precipitation nonlinearities? What's different between these models? What's 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 causing this right here? Um, so what's going on? Um, it's it's probably not coincidence that we start seeing funky things happening around about 60s, 70s, 80s, um, because so we notice that between about 1950 and 2000, we start seeing nonlinearities in the Tikadi precipitation. No such nonlinearities in the new and concurrent increases in CFC emissions over this time. So this is uh, what's used in the model right here. So is this a coincidence? Answer, no. Um, so um, skip that. Um, and so remember when we looked at the 30-year trends in, um, in surface temperature, we didn't find any major differences. We didn't find any nonlinearities. The nonlinearities were mostly in precipitation. Um, but that's because we were looking at surface temperature. What happens if we look at temperature aloft? If we suspect that this has something to do with CFCs and therefore something to do with ozone depletion, what we really should be doing is looking higher up in the atmosphere because we know that the fingerprint of ozone depletion is basically an ozone hole, right? We know that it cools the stratosphere and that's where we should be looking. So are there different reactions to the strat in the stratosphere in these two models? So this is NIMP. Um, this is the um, 1970 to 2000 temperature trend aloft. So basically, temperature trend above 200 millibars. And um, you can see a little bit of warming in the anthropogenic aerosol in natural cases, um, cooling in the, um, in the historical GHG in the ozone case. But basically, the historical and the sum are compatible with each other in the NIMP case. Whereas if you look at the TCADI case, get lots of cooling in the long-lived greenhouse gas run. Um, in the historical run, you get cooling, but not nearly as much, not compatible with the sum of the single forcing ones. So there's nonlinearities, not only in precipitation, but also in temperature aloft in these experiments. Um, so what's going on? Um, we know that ozone forcing, the fingerprint of this, comes from ozone depletion. I kind of have to walk through this myself because I get ozone depletion, all these um, so in the interactive model, there is um, weaker ozone depletion in the historical than in the sum of the single forcing experiments. So less ozone depletion means more ozone. So why is there more ozone in the historical runs? Um, and the answer is I found this graphic online. I love this. This is methane to the rescue. Um, so halogens, um, and I don't know any chemistry, so if I say anything wrong, it's all close to this fault. <laughs> I ran this by them. Um, so we know that there's nonlinear interactions between halogens and methane. So specifically, if you've got chlorine floating around, <coughs> depleting your ozone and ruining your life, um, and you put a bunch of methane up there, the chlorine's going to react with the methane. Um, with, and the methane will convert the active chlorine into this reservoir species that doesn't directly destroy ozone. And so this interaction is going to be present in the Tikadi historical runs because you've got both methane and CFCs, which give you these chlorine, these ozone depleting substances. But it's not, this interaction is not present in the single forcing runs because in the single forcing runs, you've got one with just methane and then one with just CFCs, basically. And so you don't get this interaction between them. And so it would make sense that in the historical run where you've got methane, which is converting your mean ozone depleting things into benign reservoirs that don't deplete ozone, it would make sense that you would have less pronounced, um, you would have less pronounced ozone depletion in the historical case. Um, and that's indeed what you have. So um, this is the ozone column burden that I just finished pulling off this cover like five minutes ago. Um, so, um, this, uh, the black is the historical, um, 
this is the long-lived greenhouse gas. Um, that help? Okay. I mean, whatever. Um, and the point is that here, the sum, um, you get more ozone depletion here in the sum than in the historical. And you also get a much slower recovery here in the sum. Um, and I think the next step here, this is the total ozone column burden, but I think the next step is to separate this out into what's going on in the stratosphere and what's going on in the troposphere to really separate out um, what's happening with ozone in this case. Um, so I kind of now want to switch and talk about physical mechanisms. So if this is really, yeah? Yeah, so back a couple of slides. Uh -huh. Just out of curiosity, can you say what happened to the, uh, those two species? I don't know, Cosgus. Which two? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Your HCL and your CH3. So HCL will hang around until at some point it will photolyze and give you back the chlorine atoms, but that might be anywhere else in the world, not where it is cold enough to deflate ozone. And it will be off phase from the time that you have this massive depletion that forms the ozone hole. And the CH3 is so, so reactive like hell you, you won't even see it even if you try to. And it will immediately grab molecular oxygen and form peroxy radicals that will just go through the standard chemistry that happens throughout that is either ozone forming or ozone depleting depending on the NOx levels. But, um, so CH3 is a standard product of methane oxidation regardless of the oxygen. And the case here is that instead of the standard <laughs> oxidation chain that goes through OH radicals, you also have the chlorine atoms. So for methane and the corresponding CH3 production, it um, doesn't make any big difference whether it is chlorine or OH. Eventually it's going to end up as CO2? Yeah. It goes through formaldehyde, CO, and then CO2. <coughs> yes. The temperature activation. Mm -hmm. Of what? Wait, activation? Yeah. Which activation? Whether you get the HCL actually coming, coming back in. Yeah, so the water vapor in these interactive runs will affect the stratospheric chemistry and temperature uh, based on the modus radiation. Now, whether that will be enough of a signal to, be any, to give you anything significant, I don't know. Probably having CL, plenty of CL might mean that you have more OH surviving. Probably, but I don't think that it, this might be significant because you have so little water vapor up there either way. Well, radiatively, it's quite significant. Right? Radiatively, yeah, yeah, of course. And that is included in the model. That's a great segue back into from chemistry, which I don't know anything about, to physics, which I also don't know anything about, but should. Um, so I, I feel more comfortable when I'm talking about physics. So um, we've established, I think, that there's something going on in this academy. No, she's the granddaughter of the Nobel laureate. Really? Which one? Max Born. Who is that? Really? Olivia Newton. Olivia Newton. John. Well, now everybody has learned something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> I want to admit it, it's not a coincidence. Granddaughter? Okay, so I feel like um, there, there are things that we, that are definite and there are things that are speculative here. So it's definite that there are nonlinearities in precipitation in the TCADI model that are not present in the new model. There are definite that are, there are nonlinearities in the temperature of law.
I've done this hypothesis <coughs> testing with um, anthropogenic versus natural to kind of rule out the role of the natural forces, and it, that's completely linear. You can, mm -hmm. can't be case, um, or rather not linear, but you cannot reject the hypothesis. Yeah. Um, and um, I mean, there's nothing else that physically could really be happening up in the upper stratosphere, right? Um, and so I, I would suspect that that's, that's the case. Um, Larissa right now is doing a run, very helpfully, to separate out um, CO2. So right now we've got a CFCs only run, but we don't have a CO2 only run. So we don't have a greenhouse gases without CFCs run. So that would be interesting to look at, sort of nonlinearities between the CO2 and CFCs, which we can't look at right now. Yeah, she can even do a run with the CFCs and methane. Yeah. Yeah. And nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So why would ozone depletion affect global average precipitation? It seems like these are these are happening at very different places. These are very different physical processes. Why would that be reflected in precipitation? Um, and so I think the the answer I've got kind of two cartoons to try to describe why this is happening, um, and hopefully one of them will will work. Um, so um, I think the, the story is very much a story about energy imbalances at the top of the atmosphere versus energy imbalances at the surface. So at the very instant that forcing changes, you get an immediately immediate top of the atmosphere radiation flux because that's what forcing means. Um, the atmospheric time scale to respond is on order of weeks. But because there's a bunch of ocean on the Earth, the thermal inertia of the ocean means that the tropospheric warming initially exceeds the surface warming. And so the atmosphere has to adjust so that the surface energy imbalance is equal to the top of the atmosphere energy imbalances. And there's basically two choices that the surface has. You get sensible and latent heat fluxes. That's how you get energy away from the surface. So this is a cartoon um, from this really nice paper, which I like, by Andrews et al. and Jay Klein. Um, and this is not ozone, but the fast effect of carbon dioxide. So this is the explanation for why that excess precipitation in the NINT historical GHG case and in the TCADI um, case, along with greenhouse gas case, before CFC start being, start, start being emitted. So um, if you instantaneously double CO2 in the atmosphere, before the Earth has the chance to warm up because of that thermal inertia in the ocean, you've got a radiative imbalance at the top of your atmosphere of about three watts per meter squared. The surface, however, only sees one watt per meter squared of that, which means that you have to have tropospheric adjustments to get rid of two watts per meter squared. And so it turns out that, especially for an atmosphere in radiative convective equilibrium, the easiest way to do that, the way the atmosphere ends up doing that, is adjusting its latent heat. And so the way I like to think about this is you are heating up the atmospheric column with that two watts per meter squared of extra energy. That is energy that you don't have to play with if you want to release latent heat. And if you want to precipitate, you have to release latent heat. That's what precipitation is. And so what the atmosphere ends up doing in this tropospheric adjustment is fast is decreasing precipitation. So if you fill the atmosphere up with CO2, you're heating the atmospheric column, which makes you less able to radiate away the latent heat that is released in precipitation. So this is the fast response of um, precipitation to carbon dioxide. Now obviously, eventually, um, in an abrupt two times CO2 case, the Earth is going to warm up, it's going to start coming into equilibrium, and then you get that precipitation increase with the increasing surface temperature. So clausius papyron, there's more uh, water vapor in the air, you've got more energy as the Earth heats up. So the slow response to um, CO2 is temperature mediated, and that's going to be the same roughly as the temperature mediated response in any other forced or unforced simulation. But the fast re response of CO2 is a suppression of precipitation because of these energetic constraints. Um, so ozone basically, ozone depletion, I should say, basically does the opposite. So the instantaneous radiative forcing, I took this from uh, Drew Schindel's paper in Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics, the instantaneous radiative forcing 
of ozone depletion here is an increase, sorry, a decrease in the long wave, that's a typo. And this decrease in long wave forcing here is basically the opposite of what's happening in the CO2 case. This is relaxing the energetic constraint on latent heat release. So basically it makes it easier for the atmosphere to release heat by precipitation, latent heat of precipitation. And so this is why the excess precipitation case um, for ozone depletion, this is why that excess precipitation is positive. You get more precipitation than you would expect from a temperature change alone. Um, so how do climate scientists think about forcing to conclude? A lot of us think about this in terms of energy analysis, right? We think about forcing in terms of watts per meter squared. But most models, including the NID model, the CCSM model, think about forcing in terms of concentrations. But how do policymakers think about forcing? Do they care about watts per meter squared? Do they care about concentrations? No. What do policymakers care about? Well, okay, so some policymakers don't care about forcing at all. Uh, but most policymakers want to know what they should do about emissions, right? Like emissions are the policy relevant way to talk about climate forcing. And so that means that um, as, we, as we try to make these models more policy relevant, um, converting emissions to concentrations to the radiative forcing, which dictates what's going on in models, requires us to have reliable interactive chemistry in the models. Um, and allowing fully interactive chemistry, unsurprisingly, may lead to interactions. And these complex interactions may invalidate this commonly held assumption of linearity, even at very, very large scales. So that's all I have. Happy to take questions. Thank you so much.
So even if they understood what 8.5 or 4.6 or whatever abbreviation, uh, whatever forcing you have in the contract, um, those, those are still <coughs> not, they're not policy. The RCPs are fundamentally irrelevant for policy because the emissions in them are completely opaque. And that's what policy, you're right, policy policy people are just managed. But you cannot get it from the RCPs. Um, even the initial emissions that went into the RCPs. So, um, I mean, it's really sort of starting back with some transparency. I don't know how much value there is to trying to convert these or, or translate radio forcing for policy people because I don't think it's relevant. They need to know what they though, right? Because I mean, you know, each of these RCPs is not simply a radio forcing. It's also got atmospheric concentrations associated with it. And you can convert that by making some you know, simple assumptions about ocean carbon uptake or biospheric uptake about how much, what the emission was. Well, if you knew what so they were doing, it would help. Thing. But it's, do, it's not just radiative forcing. It's emissions. And those are, w and those are opaque, uh, practically opaque. No, that's right. my argument. It's not as opaque as it seems because um, if they're, if they're concentrations that are part of these RCPs. I mean, that's what we actually Well, they are, they, they are calculated from the emissions. Right. And then, yeah, but what I'm trying to tell you is for the emissions, if the policy people are interested in emissions because they want to reduce them, they need to know what they are and they want to reduce them, then this is irrelevant to them because we don't even know what the emissions are or how they were calculated, let's well, say for the futures. Okay, but I guess my point is that yeah. we know roughly how they're calculated. And and so it's not I, I don't, and I spent more time than probably anybody else. You don't know how they were calculated. I, I, Maybe I, I should do it. What I would say is just take the concentration change and then multiply roughly by factor two because that's roughly the uptake. But this is not region. relevant for a, a, a policymaker. They need to know what the emissions were from sources to know how they can be reduced. So for specific sources, that's true. Well, well it's for methane in general. Um, I, I, it, 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 I could not get a paper published that looked at the RCPs and other projections could not get it published. They said you can't, and they were the RC, published RCPs and they were already being used. But no, you have to get all the models from all the integrated assessment people. But even if you had them, there's no mitigation in there. There's no explicit mitigation in them. Well, um, the policymakers also can just take a total cap on, um, uh, the mes estimate on to cap on total emissions. Well, well they're only the anthropogenic, we should just say, just say that too. So for methane, 30% of the total is what I want to say. But still. But they don't, I mean, why is it opaque? If it wasn't opaque, then policymakers could at least see what was the future projections. But you can't even get it. You get these grouped things. So you get animal, for methane, animals, rice, burning, whatever. There's no way to understand what's in them because they didn't find it. So, yeah, that's what policymakers want to know. And it, I don't think it's as you know, as converting radiative forcing into you can't even get back to emissions. Well, for, for methane, you can start to get back to emissions once you have good global observations of methane concentrations. That's what people have been doing for a long time. But the thing is, the emissions are calculated yeah. by but somebody. But if you don't have good global observations of methane, I think you do. Yeah. You have very coarse resolution, so you can't really. Um, well, I mean, besides the network, the ground network, you know, I mean, there are. So, so they did. Field is field is pretty yeah, but it's very coarse resolution, and so what? with the Central Valley is uh, California well, is like yeah. a third of a pixel. No, so when they did it, so when they did a field experiment in 2010, mm -hmm. uh, looking at how well they were doing, mm -hmm. they found they were off by a factor of two in the Central yeah. Valley, even given that they had measurements on the ground in yeah. the Central Valley. So there's twice as much methane coming out of the Central Valley in California as people thought. Right. I, I wasn't thinking that's Central Valley. Big, and, right, and that's, that's something you need to know if you're going to discuss policy and uh, I'm emissions. thinking of country, maybe country-wide. 
things. California is a special case because they're very interested in all of these districts. But if you're thinking of countries, whole countries, or larger areas, then I think that there, there's better data than used to be, but with inverse modeling and things like that. But, um, so there's been a huge number of studies, and there's resource EPs, and it's, nobody really knows what to do. Except for the people who did them who aren't reporting. It's really, um, it was kind of amazing. And there's no mitigation that has to say. Did I like take control of off this topic? <laughs> Did you want to make a point on this slide? Or? Oh, no, I was just trying to get off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> <That's hard. laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.